Okay, this was the weak duality theorem. You have the dual problem and the primal problem. What this is saying that every uh, feasible dual uh, objective value is less than or uh, objective value of the objective. Uh, so sorry, sorry. Every feasible dual objective value is larger than uh, every feasible uh, uh, primal objective value. So that's what this is saying. And I gave you a proof of that, which was very easy. But uh, the main thing you want to look at, uh, think about, is this picture here. The primal problem, you're trying to increase the value of z in order to optimize the primal problem and get the optimal value z star. In the dual uh, problem, you are trying to minimize the objective value. Uh, so you, you start, you, uh, you are trying to decrease the value of w until you get the optimal w value, w star. And so what this is telling us that every, every feasible objective value of the dual, W, is bigger than every feasible objective value of the primal. And <coughs> a corollary that we saw for that was that if you have that W star is the optimal value of the dual and, uh, and uh, Y star is a, is a optimal solution of the dual. I should I shouldn't say be the optimal. I should probably I should say here be a or be an optimal solution because there might be multiple optimal places. There might be multiple points where you obtain the uh, 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 optimal value of the objective function. And let's say x star is the optimal solution of the primal problem and uh, z star is the optimal value of z. Once again, I shouldn't probably say d here uh, because there might be multiple uh, optimal solutions. Whatever that is, uh, what, what we are claiming here is that z star is less than w star. The uh, optimal value of the primal is less than the optimal value of the dual, which is clear from the previous theorem. Right? If you look at the picture, uh, because every feasible objective value of the dual is bigger than every feasible objective value of the primal, obviously the, uh, the optimal value of the dual would be larger than the optimal value of the uh, primal. Is that right? Is everybody clear uh, on that? Okay, so today I uh, want to give you a uh, another result here, another result, um, <coughs> uh, in this result we uh, let's say that if x is any uh, primal feasible solution and y is any y is any dual feasible solution such that uh, the uh, <coughs> the objective value of the dual problem corresponding to y is the same as the objective value of the primal corresponding to x, right? So this is the z value, this is the uh, w value. Uh, if you have x and y such that the primal objective value and the dual objective values are the same there, uh, then then, um, then you know that x uh, x uh, um, you know that x is uh, primal optimal primal optimal and y is dual optimal. Um, 
and uh, z star is same as w star remember that I'm using z star to denote the optimal value of the primal w star is the optimal value of the dual so all I'm saying is that if you happen to know a, 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 if you happen to know for a, uh, happen to know a value of x and a value of y for which the primal and dual objective functions are the same then you know that you have found the optimal solutions why I mean again this picture tells you why because if you have uh, some b transpose y equal to a c transpose y the only way that can happen remember every every w value is bigger than a z value right so if you know that two of them are the same it has to be that they are the opt optimal values right if b transpose y and c transpose x are the same then you know that they have to be the objective uh, uh, they have to be the optimal values uh, of, of, the, uh, of the two problems. Uh, am I making sense? So note that I'm not saying yet, I haven't said yet that the, obje uh, the uh, optimal values of the two problems are the same, right? I haven't said that. So far I have proved that the objective value of the primal is less than the objective value of the uh, dual. And now we are saying if it is the case that there are uh, the, there are values of x and y for which uh, the two problems have the same uh, objective uh, values uh, then we, we have found the optimal values right? they have the same uh, optimal values um, okay uh, di is this uh, proposition making sense to you? is, is it making sense? okay so finally now I am going to state what the strong duality is. Um, the strong duality, I'm going to state this, but I'm not going to prove it yet. Uh, so the strong, strong duality theorem. Okay, so what is it telling us? Uh, the strong duality theorem t is, is, is saying the following. If, if the primal problem, if the primal problem has an optimal solution, um, x star then the then number one uh, the dual has an optimal solution as well say y star uh, and 2 um, and 2 uh, b transpose y star is the same as c transpose x star what this is basically saying is that z star and w star are the same right? So if I know that the primal has, a, has an optimal solution, then I know that the dual has an optimal solution. And in fact, they have uh, the optimal values of, of the objective functions are the same. Right? Uh, so uh, remember in the weak duality, we saw that we saw the same result with less than or equal to now we are saying they are actually going to be equal. Uh, and Moreover, moreover, uh, if uh, the primal, if the primal, I'm going to write dual in brackets. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. If the primal is unbounded, if the primal is unbounded, 
then then the dual then the dual is infeasible then the dual is infeasible oh sorry uh, I need to I was trying to save myself some time here by putting two statements at the same time in brackets let me say primal uh, is infeasible so what do I mean here I'm making two statements here one is if the primal is unbounded then the dual is infeasible and also I'm saying if the if the dual is in, if the dual is unbounded then the primal is infeasible is that making sense so that's the that's what I tried to meant by using parentheses around dual and primal so if I read the statement with primal replaced with what I have inside the brackets the statement is still true so if I know that the primal is unbounded then I know that the dual has to be infeasible. If I know that the dual is in, uh, unbounded, then I know that the primal has to be infeasible. Is that making sense? Um, of course, uh, if you know one of the statement, the other one follows from it, right? Because if I know that the primal is unbounded, then the dual is infeasible, right? If I believe that, then the other statement that the dual is unbounded implies primal is infeasible, that follows from that, right? Because the dual of the dual is dual. Sorry, the dual of the dual is primal, right? So whatever, if I can say that the, if the primal is unbounded, then the dual is infeasible, then I could also say the other statement because the dual of the dual is primal. Is that making sense? Um, now, do you remember how we uh, how how syntax identifies infeasibility of a problem? How do you detect infeasible problems by using simplex? So if I have an infeasible problem, then obviously the first dictionary that I write down is what? The first dictionary I write down would be infeasible, right? Remember, if I have a infeasible first dictionary, then what do we use? We have to do initialization phase, right? Right. And when we do initialization, what do we do? We use an auxiliary variable x0, and 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 then uh, we saw that if the auxiliary variable, uh, if there is a solution with auxiliary variable equals to zero, then the then the other problem, the primal problem, would be feasible, otherwise infeasible, right? So that's that was the uh, uh, using uh, using the auxiliary problem uh, to detect uh, whether a problem is feasible or infeasible. Right? You have to go back to that that lecture. But this could be done. Um, so let me then recap exactly what we have said uh, so far. So uh, we have. The uh, primal problem. I'm going to make a table here, and we have uh, the dual, uh, the dual problem, and let's say the primal problem could be what? There are three possibilities for any problem, right? It could be infeasible, right? Infeasible. It could be unbounded. And the other option is that there is an optimal solution, right? So, the optimal solution exists, okay? For the dual problem, I have similar possibilities, right? It could, the problem could be infeasible. Uh, the problem could be unbounded, unbounded, and the problem could be uh, optimal, right? There are three possibilities. Now, let's think about this for a second. Um, 
if the prime okay if the primal is uh, infeasible what can you say about the dual if the primal is uh, infeasible do I necessarily know that the dual is unbounded am I making sense? I'm trying to see what are the, what are the possibilities so for example if if I know that the primal is unbounded right if the primal is unbounded what do I know about the dual let me try to make a table here sorry let me try to make a table here um, Okay, so let's look at the case where the primal is unbounded. If the primal is unbounded, what do I know about the dual? If the primal is unbounded, the previous theorem tells us what? Remember the previous theorem says if the primal is unbounded, then the dual has to be infeasible. So that means this is the possibility. Uh, then I know that this is not a possibility, right? this is not a possibility if the primal is unbounded then I know that the dual cannot be optimal uh, I know the dual has to be infeasible therefore it's not unbounded or optimal right okay uh, if I know that the primal is optimal if I know that the primal is optimal what do I know about dual what do I know about dual well the strong duality theorem says what Strong duality says if the primal is uh, if the primal is optimal, then the dual then the dual is what optimal as well. So this is the possibility. So these two cannot be the possibilities, right? Is everybody okay? So this is the strong. This follows from strong duality. Now, what else can I say? If the dual is optimal, right? Sorry. If the dual is unbounded, if the dual is unbounded, what can I say? Well, already I crossed out the other options. If the dual is unbounded, then for sure the primal is what? Infeasible. So this is a possibility, right? This is a possibility. Now, this is not a possibility because if the dual is optimal, if the dual is optimal, then the primal has to be optimal as well. Why? I remember, the strong duality says, if the primal is optimal, then the dual is optimal. But the dual of the dual is primal, right? So, you can also say the same statement for, for dual. If, if the dual is optimal, then the primal has to be optimal as well. Okay? So what, what is left? The, the case that is left the, the, is that uh, uh, can, can the two problems be infeasible at the same time? Can the two problems be infeasible at the same time? Am I making sense? Remember the previous theorem says if one of them is unbounded, if one of them is unbounded then the other is infeasible. It doesn't say the opposite. It doesn't say if one of them is infeasible then the other one is unbounded, right? The opposite doesn't hold. So the question is, could, could they be infeasible at the same time? And the answer is yes. They could be both infeasible at the same time. Am I making sense? Why? Well, because I can come up with examples. Are you guys done writing it down, the table? Okay. So, uh, Let's see an example where both, it's actually not hard to come up with an example. So uh, let's say I have a primal problem and the primal problem is the following. I want to maximize, uh, maximize my, my objective function is basically 
uh, x2. And my uh, constraints are x1 less than or equal to negative 1 and negative x2 is less than or equal to negative 1. And x1, x2 are non-negative. Okay, is this uh, is this problem feasible or infeasible? Is this problem feasible or infeasible? Yeah, clearly it is infeasible, right? Because x1, at at one hand you're saying non-negative, at the other hand you're saying it's less than negative one, right? Okay, what's the what's the dual? Let's see what the, what's the dual. Okay, can someone tell me what's the objective function of the dual? Uh, in the dual, you're going to minimize w. Uh, how many dual variables do I have? How many dual variables? How many dual variables? For this primal, how many dual variables are there? Anybody? Number of dual variables is what? The same as number of functional constraints of the primal. So there are there will be two of two of them, y1 and uh, y2. And what are the coefficients of the uh, dual objective? They come from what? Coefficients of the dual objective come from Yeah, the right hand side of the functional constraints of the primal, right? So this would be negative 1 and negative 1, right? Okay, and then what are the uh, constraints? Uh, well, I am going to have constraints involving y1 and y2, so let me just write y1. Uh, well, by the way, how many constraints am I going to have for the dual? Same as number of constraint, functional constraints of the dual is the same as what? Number of? number of primal decision variables, right? The number of primal decision variables is 2, so I'm going to have two, two uh, constraints here. So y1, y2, y1, y2, and this would be greater than or equal to, what are the right hand sides? Right hand sides are coming from what? Right hand sides are going to come from the primal objective, right? Primal objective uh, coefficients are what? What's the coefficient of x1 in the primal objective? Coefficient of x2 is 1, so I'm going to get this. Now, what are the coefficients of y1 and y2 in the first? Anyone knows what, what, what would be the coefficients of y1 and y2 in the first constraint? They will come from where? The coefficients of the first constraint will come from the coefficients of x1, right? Which are what? 1 and 0, right? And what are the coefficients in the second? Well, they, they will come from the coefficients of x2, which would be 0 and negative uh, 1. So this would be a negative. Right? And of course, y1 y2 are non-negative. Now, uh, basically then, what do I have here? Let me de delete the zero terms. So this would be a zero term here, this would be a zero term. So finally then, um, do I have uh, any, is this is feasible or infeasible, the dual problem? If you look at the dual problem, where is the problem? Where is the problem? Is it feasible or infeasible? Is the dual feasible or infeasible? Infeasible, why? Because what is y2 here? y2 would be less than negative 1, right? If I multiply by negative, I get y2 is less than negative 1, but y2 has to be non-negative. So both of them are infeasible, right? So, uh, this is uh, infeasible, 
this is infeasible, so is this one. So it is possible for both problems to be infeasible at the same time. Okay. Any questions? Any questions at all? No? Okay, uh, have you guys looked into your uh, uh, presentation projects? I know one of the groups chose a network. Uh, uh, the chapter on network, that's chapter 10. Uh, they are going to do the first four or whatever, however many you haven't told me. But another group can also choose chapter 10, but the sections after uh, they finish their sections. Uh, you can also pick chapter 9, which should also be pretty easy. Okay, uh, you should pick it as soon as you can. You may, you may think you have a lot of time left till the last week, but it's not really that much time. April is here. Okay. All right. Um, so that's that's that. And now I want to speak about complementary pairs. Okay. The dual problem. See, we have to understand the connection between the dual and the uh, primal. And uh, the primal problem, let's say once one more time, uh, the general primal problem would be you have a z function which is c transpose x, and then you have the functional constraints which would be ax less than b, and a is the uh, matrix a11, a12, da da da, a1 and n, and all the way up to a, a m1, da da da, a m n. That's a m by n matrix. And then the dual problem is what? The, in, in the dual problem, uh, I am going to have m decision variables. This m is the same as the number of functional constraints of the primal. Okay? And uh, what are the functional constraints of the dual? Okay, this is important to understand. The functional constraints of the dual are obtained in what way? Well, if you look at the coefficients of the first dual constraint, the first dual constraint, the, the coefficients are coming from the coefficients of x1 in the primal constraints, right? So if you look at the primal constraints and look at the coefficients of x1, the coefficients of x1 uh, in the primal uh, form the coefficients of the first dual constraint. Everybody's clear? And, and same thing for the second uh, dual constraint. The coefficients of the second dual constraints uh, are, are, are the coefficients of x2 in the primal. Right? And so on. How many uh, functional constraints do I have in the dual? Well, the number of dual functional constraints is the same as number of decision variables of the primal. Okay? And what are the... Uh, Constants on the right hand sides of the dual constraints, well, they are, they are the uh, coefficients of the primal objective function. What are the coefficients of the dual objective function? The coefficients of the dual objective function uh, uh, are the constants, of the, uh, constants on the right hand sides of the uh, primal functional constraints. Is everybody clear on that? Okay. So I have the primal versus dual here. Now I'm going to write down the slack form for both of them. So what's the slack form of the primal? The slack form would be I, I do what? Oh, yeah, am I, um, yeah, I am writing down the slack form here. Um, Okay, I made a mistake here, which is, uh, let me fix that. Uh, can someone tell me what, what mistake did I make when I wrote down the uh, 
uh, wrote down the uh, slack forms of the two problems. Uh, the slack form of the primal is, is okay. All I did is added the slack variables, right? And then I have uh, equalities instead of inequalities, right? In the dual, though, what mistake did I make in the dual? Well, I forgot to, uh, first of all, remember in the dual, you are, you are minimizing, right? In the dual, you are minimizing. In the primal, you are maximizing, right? Am I, am I right? Now, before you write down the slack of the dual, I wanted to write down the standard form of the dual. So if I write down the standard form of the dual, then W would be replaced with what? W would be replaced with? If I want to make it a maximi maximizing problem, you're going to re replace W by negative W, right? So you're going to get negative B1, Y1, negative B2, Y2, da da da, negative BM, YM, and every inequality needs to be multiplied by negative one and uh, turn them into less than or equal to, right? So if I do that, what's going to change? What will change? Well, these signs are going to change here, right? Um, so this would be all negative. Uh, if, is everybody clear? So I want negative, 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 negative. All the coefficients would be negative of the coefficients of the matrix A. This would be a positive though. That was fine. And this would be equal to negative C1. This would be equal to negative Cn. This would be negative C2. Is everybody okay? So first, you have uh, what I did is you have to convert the uh, uh, minimizing problem into a standard form. So maximize and make all the inequalities less than or equal to by multiplying both sides by negative one, and then write down the slack form. Uh, you're going to get this. Is everybody okay? So I have the slack form for the dual versus the slack form of the primal, and I also have the, uh, the non-negativity constraints there. So I could also say y1, uh, negative y1 is less than or equal to 0, da da da, uh, negative ym is uh, less than or equal to 0, right? Okay. All right, so now I'm going to uh, define a correspondence between the dual and the primal variables. Couple of things to notice here. I'm going to say, I'm going to say that the variable x1 in the primal, the primal variable x1 uh, corresponds to what? In the dual. x1 corresponds to the first dual constraint, right? Why? Because the coefficients of x1 in the primal are, are the coefficients of the first dual constraint, right? So I'm going to say x1 corresponds to the first dual constraint, but the first dual constraint uh, can be associated with what? Can be associated with the dual slack variable y m plus 1, right? Am I making sense? Am I making sense? x1 corresponds to the first dual constraint, and the first dual constraint corresponds to the slack variable, uh, dual slack variable ym plus 1. Same way, if I look at the variable x2, corresponds to the second dual constraint, which corresponds to the slack, dual slack variable ym plus 2. So if I define an association in that way, I'm going to say that 
x1 is x1 corresponds to ym plus 1, x2 corresponds to ym plus 2, da da da, xn corresponds to ym plus n. Note that ym plus 1 up to ym plus n, these are the dual select variables. x1 up to xn, those are the primal decision variables. Is everybody okay? I'm going to use a notation here. I am going to say that x1c, if I write x1c, that would mean that the complementary, uh, the complement of x1, okay? x1c, c stands for complementary. x1c will be ym plus 1. So x2c would be ym plus 2 and so on, okay? Is, is everybody clear? Now, what, 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 what is the meaning of this correspondence? We're going to see later. But right now, I'm just defining a correspondence between the very primal variables and the, uh, and the uh, dual variables. The total number of variables in the slack form of the primal is what? m plus n. The total number of variables in the slack form of the dual is also m plus n. Okay, now let's look at the correspondence uh, between the dual, uh, between the uh, primal slack and the dual decision. I'm going to say that xn plus 1, xn plus 1, that corresponds to y1. Okay, xn plus 2 corresponds to y2, and so on. Can someone see why? Can someone see why I'm making that correspondence? I'm saying y1 corresponds to the first primal constraint, right? Why? y1 and the first primal constraints, why, why do they correspond to each other? What makes them corresponding to each other? Well, if you look at the coefficients of y1, if you look at the coefficients of y1 in the dual, what are they? They are basically giving you the coefficients of the first primal constraint, right? Except, except that these are negative of each other, right? Am I making sense? So the, the coefficients of y2 in the, in the dual gives you the co co coefficients of the second primal constraint with the negative, sign, negative change. Right, and so on. So I could say, but the first uh, uh, primal constraint I can say corresponds to the slack variable x n plus one. So in that way, I could say x n plus one corresponds to y one, x n plus two corresponds to y two, and so on, all the way up to x n plus m corresponding to y m. So what's happening? The primal decision variables correspond to the dual slack variables, primal slack variables correspond to dual decision variables, right? I, is this uh, clear? What, uh, what uh, correspondence I just defined? Again, what's the meaning of that? We're going to see that later. Now, uh, notice that what we did is then uh, what we said that primal functional constraints correspond to dual decision variables, right? Primal functional constraints correspond to dual decision variables. Can someone tell me what, in, in what way primal functional constraints correspond to dual decision variables? In what way? What did we say? If I pick a pump, if I pick a functional constraint, right? Let's say I pick the uh, ith functional constraint, ith uh, primal functional constraint. Then the coefficients of that, right? The coefficients of the ith functional, uh, ith primal functional constraint, will be the same as the coefficients of the ith decision variable of the dual, right? Is that clear? Same way, uh, I can say that the primal non-negativity constraints, right? The primal non-negativity constraints. Well, primal non-negativity constraints are basically, basically corresponds to the primal decision variables, right? The primal non-negativity constraints correspond to 
uh, uh, primal decision variables. And so what we are saying is that that is uh, uh, primal non-negative non-negativity constraints they correspond to dual slag variables. Is it clear? So let me now write down what we just said in the matrix form. Uh, if I have the primal problem, the primal problem is maximizing Z, which is C transpose X, uh, subject to AX plus XS equals to B. X is the decision variables. XS is the vector of slag variables. Same thing for dual. I have W equals to B transpose Y. We're minimizing that. Uh, what, it, what are the functional constraints for the dual? A transpose Y minus Ys equals to C. Y and Ys are larger than zero. Ys is the vector of slacks. Uh, y is the vector of decision variable, dual decision variables. And then what we are saying is that the uh, primal decision variables X corresponds to Ys and Xs corresponds to Y. Uh, we are going to write x to the c. Uh, x with the c in the superscript means the co uh, complementary uh, variable for x. What's the complement of x? That's ys. And xs c would mean what? So c uh, stands for complementary. So what's the complementary vector? Uh, uh, sorry. What's the complementary variable uh, corresponding to x? Well, that's ys. What's the complementary variable corresponding to excess? Well, that's y. Okay. Um, now, what is the standard form of the dual again? The standard form of the dual uh, would be that you have to uh, maximize, so you're going to replace w by negative w, and then in the functional constraints, you're going to change all. You're going to change the signs of all the coefficients, right? So, the standard form of the dual would be like this: uh, W is negative b transpose y, and then the uh, the uh, functional constraints would be negative a transpose y plus y s equals to negative c, and then you have y and y s larger than zero. Uh, is everybody okay? Everybody's okay? Let's carry out an example of what we mean by complementary pairs. Uh, let's say I have, uh, let me know if you're done writing this down. Let's say I have this problem here. Maximize z x1 plus 2 x2 and I have these functional constraints. Last time we wrote down the corresponding uh, dual problem and the corresponding dual problem is right here. We actually did that example last time. Right? How do I come up with that dual problem here? Well, first of all you decide how many dual variables. Well, the number of dual variables would be what? One, two, three, four. So I have four dual variables. What are the coefficients of the dual variables in the dual objective? Well, they, are, they will be the negative of the right hand sides here. Why, why negative now? Because I, I am writing the standard form, right? So you take the negative 2 here, negative 11, negative 3, negative 6. Finally, um, you're going to write down the functional constraints of the dual. Well, uh, the uh, coefficients of the first dual constraint will be coming from the coefficients of x1 in the primal. So what are the coefficients of x1? Negative 3, 0, 1, 1, right? You're going to take the negative of them. So um, I have a mistake here. This should be a plus. This should be a plus. Why? Because I have negative 3 in the primal, so I have to change it to a positive 3. And then I, uh, the rest of them are right. Um, Remember, y5 is a slack variable, so that's with the plus. Uh, what are the coefficients of the uh, uh, dual, uh, second dual constraint? Well, they are coefficients of x2. So, where am I getting my phone? Um, 
I'm getting them from what? Negative, negative, positive one and zero, right? Negative, negative, positive one and zero, and then plus y six here. Um, okay, I. Uh, Oh, I think I mixed up the two problems, didn't I? 2, 11, 3, 6. Oh no, I didn't mix up, sorry. This is, this is correct. Remember x3, x4, x5, x6. Uh, the reason I got confused is because I saw this x3 here. And I was like, do, do, I, do, do I have three decision variables. No, I have only two decision variables in the primal. So this is it. So these are the uh, constraints of the dual. And so what are the complementary pairs? X1 will, co X1 will, be, uh, will correspond to what? What's the complement of X1? The complement of X1 would be which one? The primal decision variables correspond to what? The dual select variables, right? So, so x1 will correspond to what? x1 will correspond to the first select, right? x2 will correspond to the second dual select, right? And then x3 is a select of the primal, right? So x3 is the first select of the primal. It's going to correspond to the first decision of the dual x4 is the second slack of the primal it's going to correspond to the second decision of the dual and so on right so these are the complementary pairs x1 the comp the complementary variable for x1 is y5 the complementary variable of x2 is y6 the complementary variable of x3 is y1 the complementary variable of x4 is y2 and so on is, there, is everybody clear? So all I did is defined uh, a correspondence between the primal variables and the dual variables. Okay. Again, uh, I haven't told you what, what is the underlying meaning of it. Uh, all I said, this is the correspondence. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to end here. Next time we're going to see what, what they mean and so on. So what you need to be uh, need to be able to understand before now and then is make sure you understand this example how uh, how uh, how you're coming up with the complementary uh, pairs. Okay, this is actually going to give us a correspondence between primal and dual solutions.